programming on WTTW is made possible in part by viewers like you and by the following. Grove Dental provides comprehensive dental care from the first tooth to braces to adult dental needs. With over 30 dentists and specialists, Grove Dental is here for the whole family. Locations in Bolingbrook, Downers Grove, Wheaton, and Lombard. Learn more at grovedental.com. Hey Chicago, I'm Harry Lennox, and here's a few words we all need to hear right now. COVID-19 has taken the lives of so many and has distanced us from the ones we love. But thanks to science, we have vaccines that can help us get back to our most full lives. The vaccines are safe, they'll save lives, and we all need to be in this together to come out of this pandemic. In the meantime, wash your hands, wear a mask, watch your distance, and please, when it's your turn, get vaccinated and help protect Chicago. For more information, visit chicago.gov slash COVIDVax. At UI Health, we know a safer future is a healthier future, which is why we're continuing research on COVID treatments and therapies. Keeping our patients safe while they receive care. And bringing the vaccine to more people and more communities. Chicago, a healthier future is on the horizon. Let's get there together. Learn more at uihealth.care. Programming on WTTW is made possible in part by Tawani Property Management. On Masterpiece. To date, no war material has been provided to the Allies. My country is bleeding, and the help from America hasn't come. She's manipulating you. All she sees is a man who happens to be president. Atlantic Crossing on Masterpiece. Sunday at 8 on WTTW. Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. We'll be joined by our Week in Review guests in just a moment, but first, some of today's top stories. ComEd could have some competition as the city's sole power supplier. Today, Mayor Lori Lightfoot issued a request for information to solicit possible bids from other electric utilities. ComEd's franchise agreement with the city to supply power to all homes and businesses expired last year. Lightfoot says she wants ComEd or whoever the next provider is to be climate friendly, provide assistance to low income customers, and to have good ethics and corporate governance. A West Central Illinois Congresswoman announces she will not seek re election to another term. U.S. Representative Sherry Bustos from Rock Island says she's going to step down at the end of her current term in 2022. Bustos won her last race by four points in a district that went for Trump in the last two election cycles. And Illinois health officials report 3,200 new COVID cases in the last 24 hours with 33 additional deaths. That makes for a total case count of 1.335 million cases and 21,960 deaths. And the state reports more than 31% of Illinois residents are now fully vaccinated. The Bears' blockbuster first-round pick visits his new digs at Hallis Hall. The team shocked the NFL by trading up to draft star Ohio State quarterback Justin Fields last night. And Fields didn't waste any time getting to know the local media. At a news conference this morning, he said he was excited to go to a team with the tradition that the Bears have. The history here, the, the, the pride, you know, here in Chicago is just, just, just unmatched. And, you know, I just, just, just love the energy already. And I'm, I'm just, you know, glad to be a bear and, you know, glad to be a part of this great city and great um, organization. So I'm, I'm excited. And now he has someone up front to block him. In the last few minutes, we hear that the Bears have drafted offensive lineman Tevin Jenkins. More on that in just a bit. Now to our Week in Review panel. Joining us are Alex Hernandez of Block Club Chicago, Mike Mulligan of WSCR The Score Sports Radio, Kristen McQuarrie of the Chicago Tribune, and Maudlin Ihejerika of the Chicago Sun-Times. Let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, a double whammy of indictments uh, on Thursday. Uh, Kristen McQuarrie, first with Alderman Patrick Daly Thompson, seven counts in connection to non repayment of loans at the now defunct Washington Federal Bank for Savings. Explain these charges for our viewers. Well, these seem to be separate from what the federal prosecutors have been looking at as it relates to ComEd and red light cameras. 
this was something they looked at into regards to the collapse of a bank. And anytime a bank collapses, you have a lot of people who have their lives and monies invested in this bank. And so the feds come in pretty hard to research what went wrong. And apparently along the way, this was before Alderman Thompson became Alderman in 2015, they discovered that he had received a number of loans from the bank where it appears he was not required to repay them. Um, I think the number was up to like $220,000 in various loans. Now, the alderman says that he has repaid these loans and this is not an issue and he is not guilty of these charges, but he's facing an issue where there's obviously a conflict of interest potential here and the fact that um, this bank and four of its higher executives have all been indicted on embezzlement charges. And you have an alderman who's accused of possibly being a beneficiary of that and receiving loans from the bank and not having to pay them back. A lot of red flags here at Marlene Hedgerica, four top executives, 10 defendants in total in connection with this whole investigation. Does that tell you that there might be more to come uh, on this with uh, Alderman Daley Thompson? We don't know the full story yet. Of course, of course. This has been coming for quite some time and it's been by drips and drabs. And every one that is, that is indicted is always someone who is going to reel in someone else. And so, yes, the numbers have been growing and, and it's quite clear that the investigation is not done yet, that this net is going to bring in a lot more fish. And uh, some of these uh, 10 defendants might know more about Daley Thompson's activities. Daley Thompson might know more about some of them. And we should mention uh, the reporting of Tim Nobeck in your paper uh, model in the Sun-Times uh, mm -hmm. blowing this uh, open. Uh, Mike Mulligan, uh, Daley Thompson, the Daley dynasty, he was thought of as uh, potentially the next um, you know, most likely person to become mayor out of that family, son of Mayor Richard M. Daley, grandson of Richard J. Daley. Does that kind of put a fork in that dynasty now? Well, I mean, you start out with, you know, the presumption of innocence, and I don't know that we can say that at this point, but I thought that had already happened, right? I thought that, that Lori Lightfoot's victory was sort of indicative of, of, of a different political reality in Chicago. And, um, I had a hard time believing when I was reading of this story that that the dynasty still existed. Now, maybe that's naive of me, but I, I thought we had kind of uh, shifted into a different direction. Maybe a quieter dynasty at this point. You've got some members of the family in political positions, but certainly not the top dog position. Uh, Alex Hernandez, there's also the indictment now of former Alderman Ricardo Munoz from the 22nd Ward, Little Village, 16 counts related to using funds from the Progressive Caucus Political Action Committee for personal expenses like trips, sports games, a purchase at Lover's Lane. How much trouble is the former Alderman in here? Um, a lot, I would assume. I mean, this is an ongoing thing where uh, I think it's like, what, eight or seven percent of the city council members in the past X amount of years are all in, under indictment. So, yeah, there, it's not great. Uh, I, I can't even keep track. There's a, has my alderman been indicted? I think there's a little online tool for residents to check that. Chris, yeah, there is, yeah. Two of these indictments back to back, uh, d does that tell you that uh, the U.S. Attorney John Lausch, before he leaves, is, is sending a message? I mean, there have been a lot of indictments under Lausch, but two like this right away. Absolutely, on the same day. Um, and yes, the, like the Munoz, the Munoz indictment in particular, going after someone who spends campaign funds on personal expenses is a little bit outside of the realm of what federal prosecutors usually go after, that there is a lot of leeway in Illinois election code that allows longtime politicians to spend um, campaign money on personal expenses. There's an ethics law that goes back to 1998 that allows them to do so. So um, it's a little bit outside of the parameters. And also it was a little maybe under the radar, but there was a Worth Township committeeman, a former state rep um, named John O'Sullivan, who was also indicted in the last couple of weeks. And so, um, yes, I do feel like John Lausch's time is limited. He was given sort of an extension under the new Biden administration. And maybe this is a last minute push to try to bring as many people in as he can to like tie up some of these um, investigations. And we also know that former Alderman Danny Solis had worn a wire for a long period of time. And a lot of aldermen were wondering 
Well, what did Solis record? So a lot of nervousness over there. Mike Mulligan, um, hints of life returning to normal in Chicago. Fans going back to the United Center for a Bulls and Hawks games, although they're saying they only want to cap it at about 20%. Why is that? You know, it's indoor, I think. And frankly, uh, I think, Paris, when we look at where both those teams are at, maybe they thought there was a chance that one of them would be in the playoffs. Very unlikely at this point. So there, it's, it's almost just a nominal type thing. I think there are two Hawks games involved and, and four or five Bulls games. It's not, it's not really a return to play, but it's more, I guess, because the outdoors with baseball, they wanted to kind of throw a bone to the, the teams at the United Center, the winter tenants. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like neither will make the playoffs, so there won't be any need to kind of extend it beyond that. Right, a little too late. There was some hope that maybe the Bulls would squeak in. Uh, Model and you had Jerika. Are you confident that the COVID numbers are, are in a good place, that this uh, loosening of restrictions this week, Navy Pier reopening, outdoor festivals coming back in a limited capacity, that this can go on uh, safely? Model, I think you're muted. I, you know, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I'm one of those that uh, is uh, very weary of, um, you know, the restrictions as they lift um, and others following protocol. So um, I, I'm probably not one to ask, but I think that, you know, according to CDC, these these protocols are, are absolutely appropriate at this time. It is absolutely appropriate for the city to be able to open up these venues um, because outdoor is supposed to be safe for those who have been fully vaccinated, even among others who have not been fully vaccinated. And so it's a very exciting prospect for a city that has been you know, shut down for so long. And most importantly for our businesses, they really need this. So I'm excited for them, but I remain weary for myself and um, we'll see. Certainly going to be a personal choice for a lot of people about whether to return to some of these events. Let's talk about the other big story of the week, another police shooting video released, this of Anthony Alvarez. Uh, first, Alex Hernandez, your reaction when you first saw this video? Uh, I had to watch it a bunch of times to uh, write the article, and it is not a, it is a horrific video. And do we know, you know one of the things about this case is, the police have not said a lot about the circumstances that led to this foot chase. We know it went through a parking lot at, at a gas station. The police are going in an alley, and then they corner Mr. Alvarez uh, in a yard in front of a home. Mayor Lightfoot said something about a routine traffic stop. Do you know any more about why the police were apparently after this man? Yeah, so the narrative regarding this keeps on slightly changing. As, um, more details that are revealed about it actually raise additional questions, right? So when the shooting first was announced by the news affairs, the public relations office of the Chicago Police Department, they said it was a confrontation, and that's why they were chasing him. Uh, or so then later on, we were asking, well, what led to the chase? What inspired officers to want to chase this man? Uh, wasn't a clear answer, wasn't a clear answer. And then when the video was released, um, right before then, um, after the family had seen the video, but before it had been released to the public, during a morning press conference on Wednesday, Mayor Lightfoot said that it was a traffic stop, which again, outside of that, we had no context. After the video was released, you see Alvarez exit a gas station at Laramie and Addison, uh, holding a, a white bag. A police car had been driving east on Addison, went south on Laramie, did a U-turn on Laramie to go back up into the gas station uh, that Alvarez was walking by, turned on the sirens, and then started pursuing him when he ran. Um, again, so we saw that happen, but we had no context then of, well, why did they do the U-turn to turn on their lights? Yeah. Um, today, the lawyer for uh, the officer who killed Alvarez, um, Evan Solano, uh, Solano his attorney said that apparently there had been a suspended driver's license for Alvarez, and that's why they had interest in talking to him while he was walking down the street, which, again, another situation where he was walking on the street, but he had a suspended driver's license, and this is why they turned on their sirens to go and, after and him, how, according how would, to the attorney of the officer. So that's just more questions there. And how would they be able to identify that by just looking at someone walking down the street? Um, Maudelin Ihejerika, at the same time, Alvarez has a gun. Um, he is uh, seemingly uh, evading arrest. Is, is it hard to, to bring charges against an officer here with these circumstances, even if there's so many questions about 
why this shooting even happened. You know, it is always hard to bring charges against any police officer in any police shooting. So that's the first thing. And then you add a situation where the victim did have a gun. So many of these other police shootings that really have roiled our nation of, you know, pe people of color, they were unarmed and, and, and they're, it's less, it's really less debatable um, in many of those situations. But in this situation, now you have a victim who has a gun. And so you have people who are saying, well, the police officer, you know, was was chasing someone with a gun. Um, the bottom line, though, is that anyone who will watch this video will see some of the same dynamics that we've all seen in all of these traumatic videos, which are truly traumatic to watch. And that is someone who was not who was not turning who was not turned toward a police officer with a weapon. And in and, 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 and what seemed to be in a threatening way, what we see is a victim who was running and shot in the back. So the short answer is, of course, it's going to be difficult to bring charges. But absolutely, what we see in this video raises the same sorts of questions we have raised with so many other videos. You shot someone in the back. Well, and one of the things that uh, the, both the mayor and police superintendents say uh, are that changes are coming to the Chicago Police Department's foot pursuit policy. Take a look. This shooting involved a foot chase. Um, the department is making progress on my directive uh, to revise uh, the foot chase policy. We hope to roll out and implement the foot pursuit policy within the next uh, few weeks. And in fact, there is a draft of a possible new foot pursuit policy in the Chicago Tribune. Krista McQuarrie, what exactly do you think that policy has to be? I mean, I'm not sure. I just think we see now what officers see, which is very blurry and shaky footage of what they're chasing. Um, I think in every instance, first of all, the cases that we view have to be viewed on their own individually. It's hard to compare one to the next because of all these other mitigating factors. But... What is it worth for these officers to be out on a foot pursuit over what the mayor explained as, you know, a, a driver's license issue? Or, um, and I think there is a part of this that we're ignoring, which is there's a more tendency to run in communities where they don't feel like they're going to get a fair shake from the police. So to expect people to stop and exactly obey orders in the moment that they are given and in these highly um, chaotic s scenes is just, it's not, it's not realistic and we're seeing that. So I hope a foot pursuit policy actually comes out that, um, you know, you're pursuing someone who you believe is an immediate danger, not someone who is possibly in violation of um, a, a license issue or something even smaller. It just, it escalates situations. We keep talking about the need to de-escalate these situations. Alex Hernandez, what do you know about when COPA might come out with its investigation here? That's as good a question as any. I mean, I keep on reaching out to them. Um, I reached out to them multiple weeks in a row, almost a full month of me reaching out to them before they finally announced that the family was going to be able to view the video. And it wasn't COPA who announced that they were going to show the video to the family. It was the family contacting me saying, oh, COPA said we could watch the, the video Tuesday night. So um, they're playing it very close to the, to the best on that. And actually jumping off something um, Kristen said, uh, regarding the foot chases, I talked to Alderman Martin about this. Uh, he is one of the people who helped draft the consent decree that the Chicago Police Department is under right now. One of the things that uh, he and the other people who drafted the consent decree identified back in 2019 was that foot chases escalate things unnecessarily. Um, flash forward, we're in 2021, and within one week, you had two foot chases that escalated into fatal shootings of two people by police officers, one of them being 13 and the other one being um, Anthony Alvarez. So, I mean, jumping off to that point, it's something that was on the city's radar. It was something that was on the police department's radar where the federal consent decree said, hey, the foot chases that you allow officers to engage in for something, regardless of what it is, puts the officer at risk, puts uh, the public at risk, it puts the person they're chasing at risk because it unnecessarily escalates things. So um, when I've talked to elected officials and some um, community organizers about this, one thing that they're really frustrated at is the fact that the city knew it had to do something 
it's been dragging its feet to do something. And now it's another two people who have died because of that. And now there's more urgency. And what uh, onlookers say is there really is no foot pursuit policy. There has been none. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, the new census data is in, and Illinois is losing a seat in Congress. Here's what Governor J.B. Pritzker had to say about Republicans are doing with drawing the new map. Right now it looks like they're just saying no. Uh, they're not really engaging, and all they're doing is uh, is you know fighting uh, in these redistricting hearings, which I think have been so important for hearing what people across the state really want in a redistricting map. So obviously the state loses a, a congressional district because it's lost a little bit of population. Mike Mulligan, are you surprised the state is losing population that about 18,000 folks decided that Illinois was no longer for them? No, uh, I'm not surprised by that. I think that if you think about you know, the problems we're talking about right here, I think there are a lot of, uh, of scary things going on. And I think there are other places in the country where people may feel like they have more space. Uh, you know, certainly when we look at the, the, the COVID uh, issues that propped up and all the, all the issues that happen when people are on top of each other, I, it doesn't really surprise me. It, it's also a question of where you can work and we're seeing more people work remotely and people able to do their jobs elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think the taxes, everything combined, it doesn't stun me that we're, we're losing uh, people from Illinois. Uh, Maudlin Hedjerika, one less congressional district. The Democrats are ostensibly going to draw a map here. What's that map going to look like? What district gets drawn out? And now you throw in Sherry Bustos in, in a swing district uh, in the western part of the state. She's retiring, sure. that is. You know, it, it's it's clear that the Democrats are going to draw the new map in their favor. I mean, that's that's the bottom line, and 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 none of us should should dance around that. Um, even though the uh, Republicans are 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 feigning complete outrage, it's what the Republicans did when they were in control. And I think that you know there are certainly at least um, one Republican freshman congressman, I mean congresswoman, who is vulnerable. Um, and I think that we're going to see um, we're going to see a loss of a Republican district. The, the, the issue here is that maps have to be uh, redrawn at a certain point, but it's going to be before the official census numbers come out. Kristen McQuarrie, you know, Governor Pritzker said on the campaign trail he wants an independent group to do this. Um, should he be held to account uh, pretty tough here for going back on that now? Uh, yeah, um, I just I just think that. The, the hypocrite, and again, just for your viewers' sake, I write opinions so I can express my opinion. So you have opinions. Um, <laughs> so I have opinions. Um, almost every Democrat in the legislature right now, House and Senate, is on record supporting taking this process out of the hands of politicians. And they are now sitting by and letting the politicians, their leaders, um, redraw the map, which voters have over and over and over again said they don't want this to happen, but they're not even allowed to vote on it because the legislature won't put it on the ballot. So the idea that that the governor, who at one point contributed $50,000 of his own money to an independent map process, is now just you know throwing up his hands and saying there's nothing I can do when he could actually take a very bold step and veto a partisan map that is sent to him is again why people lose trust in government there's no question about it if you're tired of one party control in springfield if you believe that there is a voice or there should be for some sort of opposition party there is something the legislature can do they can let this go past the june 30 deadline and then it forces them to create more of a bipartisan um, committee to draw the maps but they're not going to do that Right. The way the rules are set up, if it goes past that deadline, it's a bipartisan commission. But there's questions as to the legality of uh, the map redrawing before those census numbers come out. So I'm sure Republicans will sue or there will be lawsuits on whatever map is drawn. We should also mention the, the drawing of the maps, the party that's in control in most states, uh, gerrymander, redistricting, with the exception of a few states like California or Iowa, where there are independent commissions uh, that do it. So this is a red state and a blue state thing. We have to talk about um, the uh, great news for the Bears, we hope. Uh, uh, Mike Mulligan, uh, Justin Fields, uh, once again, Ryan Pace, the general manager, uh, moves up to get a quarterback like four or five years ago. But this really feels different, does it not? I think this really is different. And I think that partly it's different because I'm not sure that Ryan Pace was making the call. When you look 
at the um, the skill set that Justin Fields brings to the table, it is more in line with Deshaun Watson, with Patrick Mahomes, than it would be with Mitchell Trubisky. So this is a this is a quarterback that they moved up to get. First of all, you know he was the guy that was sort of under the most scrutiny for some reason during this process, which is a is a it's a brutal process uh, getting drafted into the NFL. He was basically considered the number two quarterback in the NFL draft, and he dropped all the way to 11, and then they traded up to get him. So it wasn't like they were at two, or three rather, trading up to two like they did with Trubisky. Um, this guy's played in a lot of big games. This guy's got a, you know, again, he's he would seem to be a pretty good fit into the scheme that Matt Nagy wants to run, which is the one we see Patrick Mahomes in with the Chiefs. So, you know, it's it's really exciting. It's a great lift given how despondent I felt uh, Bears fans were with the fact that there was really little, if any, accountability at the end of the season. And, um, and, and this gives a little bit of a buzz to this you're, team. You're looking at one of those formerly despondent Bears fans. So do you think he's the starter uh, in game one, or is Andy Dalton going to start out of the gate? No, I, I think Andy Dalton should and will get the first bite at the apple. And, you know, the thing is, Bears, this is not like a Mike Lennon situation because this is a guy that actually has had some success in the league before. I would imagine that he will be about as motivated as he can be at this point in his career because he knows that if he missteps, this guy's ready to, to step in. Now, I think it's going to take a little time. Ideally, you would give him that time. You know, the oldest trick in the book for NFL coaches, GMs, is to have a young quarterback and to move him in at the end of the year and create some sort of feeling they're going to win next year and thereby save everyone's job. So I don't want that to happen either. I want this to be kind of a, a fair evaluation of the best man play. And, and the Bears are on, on the hook to win if uh, GM Ryan Pace is going to stick around or Matt Nagy is going to stick around, but maybe he saved himself with this pick. And then he gets Tevin Jenkins, an offensive lineman that a lot of folks thought uh, would uh, stay in the first round. I want to quickly ask you, Mike, um, Aaron Rodgers, is he really going to oh. leave Green Bay, or is this uh, is this just getting uh, – should we not buy into this? This is – Oh, this is phenomenal. The Bears won the draft <laughs> before they even took their quarterback. The idea of Aaron Rodgers leaving Green Bay, the idea of infighting there, that opens up everything. The Bears won eight games last year because they can't beat Green Bay. That's two more wins a year if you get rid of Rodgers. And wouldn't it be glorious to, to have them feel how, it, how what it's like uh, to be the other side of it, to be the team without the great quarterback? Uh, yeah, I think it's great. I think he's serious. I don't think he wants to go back. And I think that you know, he publicly offended them last night. He stole all the draft vibe out of the league, and it was about him. And people say it's a prima donna move, but a year ago, they traded up and took a quarterback and, and insulted him. So now it's like a, it's like an old that married was, couple that can't live together anymore. It'll be fun to see what happens. It is fun to see uh, that uh, happen 200 miles to the mm -hmm. north. The tables are turning. Let's hope. We're out of time right now, so our thanks to Alex Hernandez, Mike Mulligan, Kristen McQuarrie, and Maudlin Ejejerica. And that is our show for this Friday night. Be sure to join us tomorrow night at 6 for Chicago Tonight Latino Voices and then 6 p.m. Sunday for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. And then Chicago Tonight returns all next week. And now for the Week in Review, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you as always for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a great weekend.